What's going on with AJ Store? He did something that set social media ablaze for about 24 hours. And his comments explaining those actions were maybe not the most believable explanation. Plus, some surprising comments from Greg Gard following Wisconsin's win over Rutgers. And of course, we're going to break down what Wisconsin can do to spoil Zach Eady's senior night. Because, oh, wow, if that wouldn't be just the best way possible to cap off this Wisconsin Badgers basketball regular season. Hello there. Hope you're enjoying your weekend and enjoying it with a six pack, the Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. I'm your host, Kedrick Stumbrus, and you can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. During the week, after games, I try to come on these shows and, and give you the one or two little tidbits of insight that we get out of midweek availability for Greg Gard, for players on the Wisconsin Badgers basketball team. And most of the time, it's not that interesting. There's there's some news and nuggets, maybe a sentence or two about injury status of players or, or other things. But usually not the kind of things that spark discussion that, that are worthy of doing a full segment on uh, of, of this show. But the post-game press conference between the Badgers players' comments and Greg Gard's comments are worthy of further discussion. One of those things, one, one thing that was said sparked a lot of d- debate, discussion, concern on, on the website formerly known as Twitter. But I think there was even more to this Wisconsin basketball press conference after the win over Rutgers, particularly with a few comments from Greg Gard that surprised me. And the the first of which was Greg Gard's comments about Kamari McGee. Of course, Kamari McGee had an excellent game uh, against Rutgers. 10 minutes, 10 points, really a big spark off the bench, although I did criticize him for some of his early defensive performance in that game. But overall, Kamari McGee played excellent against Rutgers in his first game back since January 19th when he left a game at the Cole Center against Indiana with a lower body injury. Greg Gard, after the game, what was asked about Kamari, if players who come back after long periods of time who typically take some time to adjust if he was worried about that being the case with Kamari, but clearly that wasn't the case here. Now, Kamari, according to guard, was on a pitch count against Rutgers. Those, those were his words. Greg Gard was on a pitch count. Or sorry, Greg Gard had Kamari McGee on a pitch count. I'm assuming that is per the trainers. Of course, it, it's hard to say what that pitch count is necessarily. Is that a certain number of offensive sets? Is that a certain number of shots? Is that a certain number of possessions? Is that a certain number of minutes? But regardless of exactly what it is, I would have to imagine that Kamari exceeded that pitch count that you would normally expect him to be on because Kamari McKee played 10 minutes. Wisconsin doesn't have a lot of games this season where Kamari McGee is getting double digit minutes in a game. Of course, in the game he played against Indiana, in which he got injured, he had 10 minutes. Wisconsin was pulling away very early in that one, and Kamari McGee was getting some extended minutes off the bench. Before that, Kamari McGee had only played one game in which he had double digit minutes since November 23rd. McGee was playing some pretty long minutes, and on the last show that we did, we talked about how this Wisconsin basketball bench seems to be shrinking. There seems to be fewer minutes available for Nolan Winter. I think the Marcus Silver experiment might be coming to an end. Carter Gilmore is not really seeing any time off the bench anymore. Connor Asijin didn't get into the game against Rutgers until the closing seconds. And with Kamari McGee 
and John Blackwell both available now, Wisconsin might be going small ball more often because Greg Gard seems to like that lineup. He, he made some comments in the postgame presser that he was happy with, with the small ball lineup, even against Rutgers, which has this big rim-protecting center in Cliff Morey. If Kamari Gee is getting 10 minutes in, in his first game back after not playing for a month and a half, and that's him on a pitch count, there's a chance we see even more Kamari McGee going forward in his 10 minutes, 11 points on, on five shots. Perfect from the field, by the way. That's a lot of production in one game. It, it is one data point, and, and he came back with a storm. It could be an aberration. It, it really could be, because that, that was, I think, by far Kamari McGee's best game this season. It, it was his highest scoring output this season. 11 points for him is his highest scoring output in a Badgers uniform. You have to go back to his final game at Green Bay, in which he scored 20 points uh, during a stretch where he scored double digit points in, in five consecutive games, but he, he was a scorer at uh, Green Bay. This was his primary um, primary role was a, as a scorer for, for Green Bay. He took a lot of shots. He had, had the ball in his hands in a lot of possessions. But for him to go out and play like that in the Big Ten, in his first game back in a month and a half, when we're already asking the question, is this Wisconsin bench going, going to get shorter? Is it going to go down to a, a rotation of seven, maybe eight guys? Or eight, I guess maybe nine guys. Uh, it, when you have the five starters, Blackwell, McGee, and Nolan Winter, which, which I think are really making up the bulk of the rotation at this point. And anyone else is going to be fringe, fringe, fringe minutes here and there. And, and even no, Nolan Winter, like I'm saying, he, he might be getting fringe minutes because he got very few minutes in in the first and second half of the game against Rutgers just just to give Stephen Crowell a little bit of a spell. And and I think that role is going to stick there for for Nolan Winter, but. If Kamari McGee has 10 minutes on a pitch count, those Nolan Winter minutes might be e eaten into even more. I think Connor Seijin, who just checks in at the very end of the game, I really doubt that he, he's going to see a lot of action, particularly with the emergence of John Blackwell. And it's not that Decision can necessarily come off the bench and play the point himself. Wisconsin has two other guys who can do that in, in Kamari McGee and Max Klesmit. So McGee might be seeing more double digit minutes going forward. And if he plays like he did against Rutgers, that, that that's going to be huge for this, this Wisconsin basketball team. And Max Klesmit, who left the game with, with an injury on Thursday night. Very unclear what his status is. Usually, Greg, Greg Gard is not very good at holding his cards close to the chest when he, when he talks about injuries in postgame pressers. You can typically tell if a guy is going to be back or not. I don't think Greg Gard knew right away after that game what Max Klesman's status was going to be. And that's not because he didn't know if it was a terrible injury or if he was going to be good to go. Th there's a chance Max Klesman is a little bit touch and go here for a couple of days. And if Wisconsin doesn't have to play until Thursday of the Big Ten tournament, or what is it, Friday rather, if they get the double bye, uh, that's probably really good for this team. Of course, I, they're locked into not playing until at least Thursday after the game on Sunday. So Max Klesman will have a little bit of time to rest up. But Greg Gard said in, in his post-game presser that he was told Max Klesman was ready to check back into the game and then wasn't ready to check back in. He was going back and forth a little bit, riding the bike on the sideline, trying to run a little bit in, in the tunnel. Said Max Klesman felt a little bit sore, but didn't want to push for him to get in when Wisconsin was comfortably up against Rutgers. I don't know what Max Klesman's status for 
the game against Purdue on Sunday is going to be. I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I am going to guess that when the availability report comes out on Sunday morning, Max Klesman is going to be officially listed as questionable. That is my guess. And from there, I'm not sure. If he is at least listed as questionable, he, he'll give it a full-throated effort to give it a go, of course, in warm-ups. And my inclination is to say that if he's listed as questionable, he will likely end up playing. But that is just an inclination. It is not informed by anything. It is merely a guess. And the last time I guessed about injury stuff on this show, I guess Kamari McGee was not going to play on Thursday night. Uh, and that was wrong. So hopefully I'm not wrong again. But Max Klesman questionable. I think that's going to be the case on Sunday. Whether or not he plays completely up in the air. And then not great guards comments. But the comments of the players, one really interesting tidbit, one really interesting tidbit. And I didn't see this on the broadcast. I don't know if it was shown on the broadcast. Maybe social media was buzzing thanks, thanks to some folks in, in the arena. But Jim Polzine of the Wisconsin State Journal asked AJ Store after the game, but him kissing the floor of the Cole Center court. As Storr walked off, Tether Wall, of course, kissed the big motion W logo at half court as he checked out for the final time on his senior night inside the Cole Center. I didn't see another broadcast, but apparently AJ Storr did the same. AJ Storr said he, you know, it was senior night for Tyler Wall, his last game here. So did it all for T Wall. Special night for him. His last game. There's a lot of rampant speculation about what this means for AJ Store. And he is a fringy NBA draft guy right now. A, a fringy second round pick. Not a lock to get drafted. Not a lock not to get drafted. Those kind of guys are sticking around in college basketball longer than ever over the last decade because due to players being able to secure endorsement deals and through those NIL payments, they are extremely valuable in college basketball. They, they can be enticed to come back to college basketball where their earning potential is usually higher than what it would be in the NBA G League being a fringe NBA roster guy. His value is quite high to college basketball. It, it would appear. I don't know what this means for AJ Store. I don't know if this means that he's going pro. There's a lot of people in Division I college basketball who would like to have an AJ store dynamic type score on their roster and players now more than ever are paying attention to what their market value is. Very interesting that AJ store kisses the floor makes mention of the fact that it is somebody else's last game, his words, last game inside the Cole center. Tyler Wall's last game inside the Cole Center. He does that. AJ Store does that. That would be a loss for this Wisconsin basketball team, to be sure. Because we, we've talked throughout the season that him returning, all other starters but Tyler Wall returning, John Blackwell returning, Kamari McGee returning, Nolan Winter returning after a year in the weight room, Gus Yaldin returning after his redshirt year. You bring in Daniel Freetag as another backup guard. Maybe you get Connor Asijin to return. I doubt it. That, that would be a, a roster returning so, so, so much production. And yes, 
this roster this year returned so, so, so much production and things have gone off the rails a little bit. But if you are able to return all of that, have some young guys get in the weight room, get some more experience, it would be very big for this team. And if that team brings all that experience back, except for its most dynamic score, all that experience might be for nothing. That would be really hard. It is harder than ever to keep your college basketball roster together. You And, and some of you might be screaming, well, AJ Store, AJ Store can't leave unless he goes pro. Otherwise, he has to sit out a year. There, there are currently no transfer restrictions. Tempor temporary injunctions, temporary restraining orders are, are in effect on all rules preventing movement of players, essentially. Multiple time transfers are A-OK -okay right now. Th this college basketball offseason is going to be complete free agency. So get ready. It's going to be bonkers. <laughs> Already is going to be bonkers. I think Indiana's losing its entire roster. <laughs> oh. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be nuts. I don't know what's gonna happen. The the AJ Store situation is something to continue to monitor as Wisconsin moves forward. So keep an eye on Kamari McGee's minutes. Keep an eye on AJ Store once the season ends. Keep an eye on Max Klesmit. The Big Ten availability reports on Sunday. I, of course, always always send those out. Make sure you all know what the availability of players is going to be on game days. Uh, you can you can follow me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stummers to get those updates. But the other things Wisconsin needs to watch out for in its game on Sunday against Purdue. Can it spoil Zach Eady's senior night? We're going to answer that question after we tell you about our friends over at TickPick because TickPick is where I get tickets to any Sporting event, concert, comedy show that I would like to go to. Unfortunately, I, I, I am here in South Texas. I am not getting up to West Lafayette for, for this game against Purdue. It's a shame. I would really like to go to it. But hey, if you want to go, prices starting to fall just a little bit on, on tick pick. There, there's some there there are limited tickets available. But but you can get in looking at a ticket for 206 bucks. That's cheaper than the tickets for Zach Eady Senior Night have been basically all season. But you can get in, and it's going to be the best deal that you can get. And if you use my link in the podcast description, TickPick is going to save you 10 bucks on your very first order. Plus, you pay no fees, no service fees, no delivery fees, none of this junk that other ticket selling apps make you pay pay zero dollars in fees anytime you get your tickets on TickPick. Save ten bucks on your first order by using my link in the podcast description. The link that's on your screen now. Download the TickPick app. That's T I C K P I C K. Pay no fees on tickets. Save ten bucks on your first order by clicking my link in the podcast description. Uh, coming up this week on the show, Wisconsin women's hockey. We're, we're going to have a a great 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 week. Uh, probably going to get an emergency episode into your feed tomorrow, Sunday that will land in there. Like just as the, uh, Purdue Wisconsin game is starting because the selection show for the women's hockey NCAA tournament is a half hour before the Badger game starts. So 11 a.m. Central on ESPN news, you'll be able to see the women's hockey selection show the Badgers get a win in the WCHA final faceoff semifinals over the Minnesota Gophers. Wisconsin ties the game with 8.8 .8 seconds remaining in regulation and then is able to just rip the hearts out of Gopher fans with an overtime winner by Lacey Eden. Uh, I have a recap piece of that game over up on Badger Notes. You can get that article by clicking uh, the link in the podcast description. That's going to be great. Uh, I got a little bit of a bracketology insight on where I think the Badgers are going to land in the NCAA tournament bracket up on Twitter right now. You can go find that as well, uh, but stay tuned as we talk about that. We'll get into the Big Ten tournament 
this upcoming week as well, where, where Wisconsin is going to fall, who Wisconsin is going to end up playing uh, in that first game, hopefully not playing until Friday. Uh, but regardless, going to try to bring on a guest of one or several of the programs that Wisconsin might end up playing in the Big Ten tournament this week. Uh, and we'll continue to be talking bracketology, get into some NFL free agency stuff. I assume because NFL free agency is going to be starting this Wednesday, uh, the legal tampering period starting very, 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 very soon. Uh, so, so stay tuned to the feed. This is, this is, this is a banger of a week. This is March. It's the best time of the year. So much going on, so much going on. Stay tuned to the feed right here on the Scotty six pack podcast. We'll keep you up to date on everything you need to know in Wisconsin sports six days a week. Uh, what can Wisconsin learn from its first game against Purdue? For as much as Wisconsin has slid, the, the second loss that precipitated this big slide for Wisconsin was just a six-point loss to Purdue. Yeah, it's a loss. So just six points at home feels not fun. But... Wisconsin has a lot of things that it can feel good taking away from that game. And look, I would love for the Badgers to spoil Zach Eadie's senior night. I don't think it's going to happen. And there are going to be some people. If Wisconsin comes out and gets its teeth kicked in in West Lafayette on Sunday, the Greg Gard meter will be being pushed by the biggest of haters. Purdue's average winning margin at home in conference play is 13.4 points. Purdue has not lost at home at all this season. Purdue is 27 and three on the year. All three of those losses coming on the road in Big Ten play. Yeah, Purdue hasn't just not lost at home this year, have not lost a neutral site game after they ran through the Maui tournament. Did not lose a neutral site game against Alabama as well in non-conference play outside of that holiday MTE. Purdue is a really, really, really dang good team. And if Wisconsin loses this game by double digits, probably just chalking it up to say, all right, yep, fair enough. Because I think Purdue is most likely going to be the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament. That might come down to who ends up winning the Big 12 tournament. If Houston wins through, I could see Houston getting that. If UConn runs through the Big East, they could get the number one overall seed. The selection committee seems to have a little bit of bias in terms of awarding that number one overall seed, some recency bias to how those teams in contention for it fare in their conference tournaments. Because like last year, I thought Kansas pretty clearly should have gotten it with all their quad one wins, all their quad one, quad two wins. Uh, that didn't happen, uh, but they gave, gave it to Houston after Houston won the American. Um, and Kansas fell in the big 12 championship game. Uh, sorry, my Jayhawks coming out a little bit here. Um, so I don't necessarily think Purdue locks up the number one overall seed with a win over Wisconsin, but it's going to be pretty dang close and losing by double digits on the back to back national player of the year, senior night on the road is not a disastrous loss. So great guard haters try to keep it together. I've, I've given you some, some juicy red meat over the last couple of weeks here, uh, showing that I have some sympathy for you, but this is just not the time to do it. Um, <laughs> last time out against Purdue. One of the best things Wisconsin did as one of the worst three point in defenses in the country was really run the Boilermakers off of the three-point line. Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer, both awesome, awesome, awesome three-point shooters. Lance Jones, who plays the power forward position out of a, a transfer from Southern Illinois, can also shoot the three very, very, very well. Wisconsin only let Purdue, which has the second highest three-point shooting percentage in the country, make three of 11 three-point attempts at, at the Kohl Center. That's great considering Wisconsin has, by uh, shooting percentage allowed, the 339th ranked three-point defense in the country. Wisconsin needs to try to run Purdue off the three-point line again. I, I think 
needs to do a little bit better at defending the penetration that comes after chasing them off because the, the shots Purdue was able to make inside that game shooting uh, just over 52% on twos is not a winning recipe for Wisconsin. But considering Wisconsin is not the best three-point shooting team, it is hard for me to say, sure, let one of the best three-point shooting teams try to beat you. I don't think that's a winning recipe. I think Wisconsin needs to take away from that first game that they lost close, that it needs to be doing a similar thing there on the three-point line. Against Rutgers, Wisconsin took care of the ball. Wisconsin is a good team at taking care of the basketball. Wisconsin took care of the ball much better than it did in the previous meeting between the Badgers and the Scarlet Knights. Wisconsin did have 13 total turnovers against Rutgers, but a couple of those were really late in the game with the full bench in. And the first time Wisconsin and Purdue played, Wisconsin turned the ball over only five times to Purdue's 11. These units, when Wisconsin is on offense, it turns the ball over the 49th least in the country. A very, very, very highly ranked offense by turnover percentage. Purdue's defense has a very low ranked defense by turnover percentage, just 335th in the country. The Avengers have a leg up here in the turnover battle, stealing possessions. The last time these two teams played, Wisconsin only turned the ball over five times to Purdue's 11. This is where Wisconsin needs to keep itself in the game. This is not necessarily something Wisconsin can win the game on. But Wisconsin can lose the game if it does not replicate this kind of performance again. Wisconsin, frankly, might need to double up Purdue in, in the turnover department like it did at the Kohl Center if it's going to win this one. And that, that's hard on the road. So take that for what it is. But Wisconsin needs to get a couple of these key things right that it got right in the first game to give it a chance in this one. What Wisconsin needs to change in order to beat Purdue in, in this rematch here on Senior night in West Lafayette. And I keep saying, I keep saying it. I know I keep saying it. I sound like a broken record. I've been saying it all week. Frankly, I think I've been saying it for longer than that. But I just say it because wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great? Come on. You know it'd be great. Wisconsin against Purdue needs to do something a little bit differently in order to get the win on, on Sunday. And it has a chance to do it because Purdue has a great defense better than Wisconsin's at this point. And, and Wisconsin's defense ha has slipped as of late as well, but that's not to say that Purdue's has not either since February 1st, Purdue's defense only ranks 78th in the country. When, when you, when you take that forward using the data over at Bartorvik.com, uh, by Ken Palm, Purdue has the 20th ranked defense by a just defense, uh, defensive efficiency on the season. So, Kind of a big slip there over the last mm, five, six weeks. So Wisconsin has a chance here with an offense that seemed to find a rhythm again on Thursday night against Rutgers. And you could say, oh, yeah, but that was at Rutgers. Rutgers is a dang good defense. If Wisconsin can do that against a Rutgers defense that has been very good, all season long, the, the fourth ranked defense in the country by adjusted efficiency, according to Ken Palm. And yes, Rutgers has struggled as of late. There's some motivation questions there. There's some questions about players not being in games only because they don't want to be in those games. But Wisconsin's offense was humming. AJ Storm is going to the hoop. You get a Kamari McGee involved. You're going to have a chance against this Purdue defense, which has been a little bit suspect lately. And a Wisconsin offense that didn't have its best player necessarily available to it. Stephen Crowell was in foul trouble last time. And yeah, Stephen Crowell is not the best player on this team, but he, he's a key player 
in this matchup, I think. Stephen Crowell played very limited minutes against Purdue the, the first time around uh, because he had four fouls, because he picked up those fouls early. He only had 28 minutes in, in the matchup with with Purdue in, inside the Cole Center. And to put that into perspective, the last time, time, oh no, he only played 14 minutes against Illinois too. Stephen Crowell has struggled with foul trouble as we have chronicled in, on this show. And Wisconsin is not faring well in these games where its front court gets into foul trouble. Particularly given the fact that basically every time over the last two seasons that these teams have played, Matt Painter, Purdue's head coach, has said, Zach Eady as Tyler Wall's primary defender. He does that to try to take Tyler Wall out of the game, and then he can send Zach Eady as help defense on Stephen Crowell. That's a really, really tough assignment if Nolan Winter is going to have to be in that game, if Nolan Winter is going to be forced to defend Zach Eady, if Tyler Wall is having to do the lion's share of the work in the post. You need to split up that responsibility, if only for an energy standpoint, right? If only to give Tyler Wall enough rest between offensive possessions that he's not just having to bang down low with Zach Eady. It's going to be incredibly tough. Especially given the fact that, look, with Stephen Crow out for a lot of that game, with Tyler Wall, your main front court piece in that game, Wisconsin kept Zach Eady to just six offensive rebounds in the game in Madison. This, despite the fact Stephen Crowell only played 28 minutes, and Zach Eady averages uh, 5.1 5 offensive rebounds per game in conference play. So gave up one extra rebound compared to the average. But if you have Stephen Crowell in that game, that extra offensive rebound might, might not be there. Wisconsin, not great on the offensive glass, but is pretty dang good on the defensive glass. This is another point where you have strong on strong in this matchup. Purdue with the 11th ranked offensive rebound percentage in the country to Wisconsin's 10th ranked defense by offensive rebound percentage allowed in the country. If Tyler, or, or sorry, if Stephen Krell is in this game, Wisconsin might have a much better chance at keeping up on the glass there and holding Zach Eady in check. I think it'd go a really big way in this game. If you are able to take Steven Crowell and get him alone with Lance Jones down low in, in the paint, in the post, it could be a big deal. A big deal. T take Tyler Wall, who is being primarily defended by, by Zach Eady. Make him a threat with some high-low high low action out on the perimeter, draw Zach Eady out. And Zach Eady has improved on the perimeter over the last couple of years. But if you take away the threat of the Zach Eady double coming over to Stephen Crowell, that's going to be huge for this Wisconsin offense that so often needs to play through Stephen Crowell. Greg Gardner's postgame presser against Rutgers said they, they need to attack through Stephen Crowell. He needs to attack the rim. And Stephen Crowell played incredibly well against Rutgers, against a big rim-protecting center in, in, in Cliff Amore. If Stephen Crow can do that against Cliff Amore, he can show up and do it against Zach Eady as well. Th those are both guys who have similar skill sets in rim protection, and frankly, from just a defensive standpoint, Cliff Amore is a better rim protector than Zach Eady is. Zach Eady clearly better on the offensive end, but... Cliff Murray might be a little bit better defensively. And Steve McCrawl had six off offensive rebounds in that game. Yeah, I think, what, four of them were on one possession. But do that. Let Steve McCrawl try to dominate the paint against Lance Jones. Get some outside action stuff moving for Tyler Wall early to make that those perimeter ball screens, high ball screens. Get him doing some stuff in the pick and roll up top. Maybe try to open some stuff up for, for Stephen Crowell in a baseline cut. Meanwhile, you could have something going there. And, and if Tyler Wall gets going with some actions near the perimeter early, you, you creep Zach Eady out further and further and further. 
might really open some stuff for Stephen Crowell down low and might be the missing piece for what Wisconsin needs to do in this game in order to get the big win on Zach Eady senior night in West Lafayette. That's going to do it for today's episode of the Scotty six pack podcast. Thank you for listening. While you're here, leave it a nice review, five stars, kind comments on your podcast platform of choice, whether that be Spotify, Apple, or anywhere else. You can also watch us on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Scotty six pack. And while you're there, smash the subscribe button, hit the like button and hit the bell. So you get notified as soon as we put new episodes into your feed until we talk to you probably tomorrow with a bracket reveal on Wisconsin. <laughs>